people think of me as a trainer. Oh, you must just watch people work out all day. And it's like, actually, I, I don't really do that at all. They're, what needs to happen is here. Right. Let's develop that part. Then I can show you the easy part. That's the workout and nutrition side. Welcome back to another episode of Culture Camp. I got a fun one. I got Mr. Cameron Brown. Cameron, thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. My Cam, pleasure. I've got to get my, your bio out right here because it's super long bio because you're a beast. Cameron Brown is a mindset, nutrition, and exercise coach. You're also owner of a gym. He's the owner of Evolution Fitness and personal training, a 15,000 square foot, 24-7 full service gym that features the mindset, nutrition, and exercise program he has developed over the past 15 years. Wow. Having personally completed over 50,000 coaching sessions and over 4,000 clients, both in person, virtually across the U.S. and international. Wow, that's huge, dude. Yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, I, I, I can definitely imagine. That's a lot of, dude, 50,000 client uh, coaching sessions. Yeah. So this, uh, wow. It got to a point where, because really I'm the kind of guy that I don't like to take a day off. And so when you, right. get, when you first get started, you know, it's 16 hour days, 17 hour days. And so kind of my philosophy was if I'm awake, I want to be in front of a client. And For so sure. That kind of grew through the years to the point where I was doing one hour appointments and then cut it into half hour appointments and then lumping, lumping people together to where I could see 250 clients every uh, two weeks. So wow, when we first expanded to our new location. I would see close to 500 people every two weeks. And so it was 140 appointments a week. I've been able to whittle that down. So now right. I only do about 70. But uh, but yeah, it's just been able to see all kinds of different shapes and sizes and goals. And and it's 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 been extremely rewarding because what we get to do is help people to to work towards something fulfilling and exciting so for sure no dude, that, that's super 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 exciting and the reason that i i uh am excited about this because you you do a lot of like mindset stuff which nutrition and exercising and, and either losing weight gaining muscle you've done some uh, bodybuilding com competitions yourself which is incredible like I, I i did one and it was one of the hardest things i've ever done um <laughs> and it's just a lot goes in it, but I want kind of want to go back and just, you know, how did you get into nutrition and exercise or, or in coaching? You know, what made you kind of make that that transition, you know, from what you were doing before to, to now and then getting your own gym? You know, let's let's go back and see how you started. So it would actually be going back to when I was 13 years old. Where wow. I was this awkward little overweight kid that uh, had braces and was four foot 11 and kind of the, the perfect target for for bullies and. Um, I just kind of got fed up with being, uh, picked on. And so I decided I was going to, over the course of summer between eighth and ninth grade, come back a brand new person and be this ripped guy. And then suddenly that would change how everyone would treat me. So wow, started out just, uh, running and cause that was all I knew how to do. And so it was a mile a day and then it was two miles and then it was five miles. And I got to where I had a little course that I would run that was 12 miles a day and so I would do that six days a week and then found some old weights in my garage um, and just started lifting whatever I could figure out curls bench press crunches that kind of thing and I got to where I was doing almost 5,000 crunches a week and doing these 12 mile runs every day and uh, and uh, just what that what transpired within myself over the course of that there was obviously a physical transformation but it was really the psychology behind it that changed right. how I identified myself. And um, so I come back the next school year and thinking everyone's going to treat me different because now I've got a six pack and then veins and things. And right. the guys that were jerks were still jerks. They still said the same things, but it didn't affect me anymore. And it was kind of understanding that the, the real truth of it is that our emotional response isn't based on the experience or what someone says, but rather the meaning that we give to it. Right. And that we can consciously decide what that is. And right. so what that did for me in improving my quality of life, it was at that moment, 13, 14 years old, that I was like, this is it. Like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to be a personal trainer. I'm going to be a nutrition coach. I'm going to help people. And I just never had any other inclination to do anything else. And so um, at 18 was when I got my first accredited certification, started doing personal training. Um, and then uh, at 23 was when I first opened my, my little gym. That was just kind of a glorified garage with a office attached to it and uh, all my hopes and dreams. <laughs> right. right. And, uh, and that's where I met your wife, Mikkel. Uh, that's where I started training Shaylee. And so it just started, it was just me and I had about 20 clients there and then we grew to 500 and then that's when we expanded to this larger location. Right. 
and uh, that was about 10,000 square feet. And then we just this past year expanded that. So really, um, yeah, we added on another, another 5,000, put in new personal training offices. So that's cool. Um, yeah, that's probably a little bit too much, but no, 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 that's no, really where it started. That's awesome. I haven't been in that. Well, I mean, I hope this Mikel snuck me in uh, once or twice to come check it out. Cause <laughs> well, I, uh, well, good. you know, I, I wanted to see what, you know, my, my whole in-law family, you know, uses you and goes to that gym and they talk big things about that gym. And I'm like, man, I want to go, want to go see it. So me and Mikel went one night. I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. no, <laughs> this is awesome. So I actually haven't not seen the, uh, the addition. So I'll have to go back and, and, and check it out. But you know, a, a gym, so, I mean, gyms are one of the hardest businesses to start. I mean, or, or, or to even own. I mean, a lot of people, like I was reading a study one time that, that there's, there's more gym ownership turnover than any business, you know, out there. Like, there's a lot of, even Gold's yeah. Gym has kind of, you know, we all thought they were the, the powerhouse of the gym world and they mm-hmm. kind of disappeared, you know, at least in the state of Utah. They're pretty much yeah. 100% or they are 100% yeah, out of the state yeah. of Utah. Yeah. And it's always kind of like this constant turnover. How have you been able to create, you know, how hard was it? You know, what, what struggles did you have at the very beginning where you were like, okay, you know, I'm going to, where it was more focused on pretty much I'm going to have this gym to do my, my 20 clients. And then you kind of took it to the next level. It's like, I'm going to have memberships. I'm going to, there's going to be a lot of people that maybe aren't using the personal training, but it's a gym. Yeah. You know, how was that, that transfer? Well, um, the, the primary difference was that I was a personal trainer at, at several different locations. Um, and to start out where I would just essentially pay gyms rent. And so this was taking where I was spread out, going out to people's houses and just kind of consolidating them. So the idea was not a, most gyms, they start out as, let me build a gym. Hopefully people will show up and then uh, we'll try to add in some personal training services. Right. Whereas my whole structure was, we are a personal training gym. This is a place where our clients come. And initially we didn't do any kind of memberships or anything because that was literally just a place to train clients. And so as we expanded and grew and I added on more trainers, the idea was that we were taking what I had built with my nutrition and exercise program and the psychological elements that we add into it and going every single person that walks through this door, like that's what they're going to receive. That is our service that we offer. Right. And so the, once we got to where we were bursting at the seams with, with that, then it was okay. If we're going to expand and take on this, this greater overhead, well then let's add in this membership option. Right. And so, um, as the gym has grown in that area, still the vast majority of our total membership does personal training and I think that's the primary difference is that most gyms are gyms that offer personal training, whereas we're a personal training gym that also has memberships. And right. so we don't need 10,000 members to be right. able to, to survive and, and meet our overhead. And our retention is significantly greater because everyone there has a plan, has a community, has a, a, a kind of a, well, most of them will have a trainer and have like a, a whole set system that they're working on. Right. So the, the reason I love it is because, you know, I've had a very, very long conversations with my, uh, with my, really my father-in-law is like, you know, you, you walk on water to this family, <laughs> just to let you know, but it's just, it's more of the, like, like they are completely bought in and it's basically like, a, like a mentor and coach and helping them through a, a lot of walks through this. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really cool. And, and, and like holding someone accountable. I really think that like a lot goes into that. What do you think, you know, as far as personal training and, and the success of a person and individual, do you think, you know, how, how important is that person to hold them accountable? Like that personal trainer yeah. or that, that program that they can follow because it almost turns into like a why, right? Because I know that you basically are like, Hey, you want to look like this and lose this much weight and you do all your, your measurements. Mm-hmm. Well, this is the objective and that's the goal. And yeah. now I have like a quote, you can say like a dream, like a dream bod. Yeah. And that's the goal. Yeah. And, and we're going to work every single week towards it. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's very unique. Yeah. It, it, so you know, how important is that to somebody? So, well, and our process is completely different in that way in that the first appointment that we do with somebody, we kind of, we want to categorize goals into two different sections and so we talk about outcome-based goals that are more have more numbers or statistics to them. That's like, I want to lose 50 pounds. Or I want to be able to bench press 300 pounds. And so those provide direction in creating a strategy because different workout trainings produce different adaptations, different nutritional approaches are going to gear the body towards one direction or another. But the, the bigger question that we look to get to is not what do I want to get, but rather who do I want to become? Right. 
And so that's really where we shift that first session that we go, okay, cool. So we want to lose 50 pounds. Awesome. We can do that. Okay. And there are lots of different ways to do that. But what we want to get into is uh, you want to lose 50 pounds. What do you associate with that? And really, if I had a magic wand and I could go, poof, okay, now you're everything that you wanted to be. Okay. That 50 pounds is gone. Are we imagining that there's just a switch that's going to flip on in your mind that says, okay, happiness now takes place. Right. And we want to go, okay, there are, we refer to the six basic human needs from Tony Robbins and kind of go through those during the first appointment of going, okay, so we want to meet our needs for certainty and variety and, and love and connection, significance, growth, contribution. Each of those elements need to be met as a part of what we're doing in your lifestyle change, but all geared towards the ideas of growth and contribution. Cause that's where fulfillment is going to come from. Right. And so we look at, okay, here's what you want to accomplish. Let's look at the why behind it. But then also, what are you going to do with that? Once you've lost wow. that 50 pounds and you've got all this physical freedom and this energy and you've got this physique, now you've opened up opportunities that you can go, okay, I can walk into a room and literally my physical presence has started to influence the people in this room. Right. So if that's your family, if that's your 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 business circle, your your social circle, let's look at something that you get to then go and help these people because of the decisions that we're making right now. So if we can attach all that purpose and meaning to each of the actions that stand between you and what is an outcome based goal. So that when we go say, okay, I need you to track your food. It's not like, Oh, I should, you know, I probably should track my food or I'm going to do this because Cameron's going to shame me if I don't. Right. We're going, okay, literally this is everything I can do in this moment to be one step closer to my vision for myself. And that if we establish a clear vision in the beginning, that that gives us something to progress towards. Right. Progress is what makes people happy. And so when we're doing our check-ins, we're going, yeah, okay, two pounds of fat loss. You lost half an inch off your stomach. Okay, awesome. This also means that we talked about that that hike that you like to go on with your family, and then you've been struggling with that. That was something that you did with your dad, and now you can go and share and contribute that to your children, and that these are meeting these other needs of love and connection, and, and that there's so much to look forward to because you tracked your food on that one meal. Wow. And so that's what we try to gear everything towards is that this is about a vision of the type of person that they want to become. And then therefore what, what that's going to allow them to do in contributing to others. Dude, that that's so powerful. Where did you come up with this? Because I've been around the, you know, the nutrition bodybuilding worked at GNC, all these things and been involved with a lot of gyms and done all this. I have never heard of anybody taking it to this degree. Where did you come up with this? Um, I mean, honestly, my, this goes back to when I was a little kid and just being like, I wanted, I wanted to use what I had built in myself as a way to, uh, influence others to transform in themselves, how they saw themselves, what their identity was. Right. And that really we've got our outcome based goals that are the pounds or whatever, but the, the identity is really what we're aiming for. And so, um, uh, my when we open the gym one of my base concepts and this is what i always tell my employees is that i want it to be such that when someone walks in for the first time whether they are a seasoned professional athlete or they're 450 pounds and they have never stepped gym foot uh in a gym before that they're both going to feel equally comfortable and so each aspect of our from the front door to how the staff is to meeting with the personal trainer we want everyone to be extremely comfortable and that traces back to me being this awkward, insecure, uncomfortable kid, but that I was able to get away from that. And knowing that once I, the first time I got to share that with someone, it was like, okay, this is really what it's about. If I can grow myself to the point that we talked about just a second ago, if I can create some abundance in myself in some way, and then I can contribute to others that has way more fulfillment and satisfaction than just getting the goal itself. Right. And so um, infusing that into the personal training program and looking at a, for me, I mean, this is meeting my own selfish needs of like, I can't wait to meet with a client every single day. I mean, these 50,000 sessions that I've done every single one, I'm like, okay, great. I get to contribute something. There's going to be a question they're going to have. And I get to share that with them, but then going, okay, now it's your turn to go. And what you've gathered here, go and contribute that to someone. Right. And so how that expands kind of through the gym that all of our trainers, all of our clients are looking for ways that they can go, okay, I'm going to do a little bit better. And with that better, here's how I'm going to serve someone. Right. So it just creates this unique environment within the gym 
that I think is kind of the thing that stands out for us. Dude, I love that because it, it you know, I, I believe it starts from the, the top down, right? I mean, it starts from you and in your, you know, core beliefs of how you want, want things to go. And then it gets, you know, people buying into that. And, and, and your approach is unique. I mean, you, you see it more as like a lifestyle, like, okay, cool, dude, you lost 50 pounds and you look, you look great. But like, what are you doing with it? Like how, how is, you know, the gym's one hour your, you, you know, a day. Mm-hmm. How are you yeah. the other 23 hours, you know, or, you know, sleeping, whatever. But yeah. like, I love that because it, it, you're, you're like changing. I mean, you just talked about getting an identity. You're changing their identity. You're helping them in multiple ways and, and getting to think outside of the box instead of just saying, Hey, look at me, I'm, you know, I'm buff. I got a six pack. It's like, yeah, but like, what does that in turn do for you? Can you go on those hikes? Can you wear the, the swag that you want to have? Like, do you want to wear the jeans that you like, Yeah. like getting the belief? Cause you're basically like changing their belief system and how they believe even, you know, believe and perceive themselves mm-hmm. and believe how they should be doing things. I mean, that dude, that's the coolest thing ever. Yeah. I mean, and that's literally, it sounds kind of cliche, but like you're changing their life more than just their maybe physical and health wise, like you're changing their mental state. And like, we, you know, you talk about a lot about mindset, mm-hmm. like that, that's huge because your belief is so powerful. Like we always say belief can heal you and kill you. Yeah. <laughs> and it, you know, it's true, it, it, but you're, you're changing their mindset towards the way that they look at different things. That That's well, so cool. That, that's the whole concept for, as you know, success in life and anything, if it's fitness, it's finances, relationships, it's business, that our success is going to be 80% psychology and 20% mechanics. Right. Like the mechanics are out there. The formulas are there. If you want to be successful in finance or if you want to build a body, like I always say the nutrition and exercise part, that's the easy part. Right. You that's know? there. It's just, yeah, that, the weights are there. A lot of this is it's math. It's physics equations. It's just understanding human physiology and, and how to communicate messages to your body to elicit adaptations. But the psychology side of it, I'm knowing, okay, these are all going to be decisions that I'm going to make. And what's going to provide me the will and the desire to make these decisions. And that comes down to what is the purpose and meaning behind it. And so when we go through these outcome goals, like someone says, okay, I want to lose 50 pounds. I want to tone up my arms and we'll go through the OPA method. You know, what's my outcome? You know, let's get some targets up on the board so that we know what, what direction do we want to go? Right. Knowing that progress is going to be what makes us happy at the end of the day. And we can't progress towards something unless we've created with clarity what that vision is. Otherwise we end up mistaking movement for achievement. Like Tony Robbins says, and right. uh, we want to make sure that what we do is going, okay, what I just did, I get to feel good because I just moved towards something. First, I got to know what that is. Right. But then the second step, identifying what the purpose and meaning behind what that outcome goal is, is asking why. And it's, it's fascinating watching a goal can even evolve over the course of that first appointment. If someone goes in thinking they want this and realize, okay, I wanted that just because it sounded good, but it doesn't have this deep purpose and meaning behind it. And everyone that walks through my door and ends up in those chairs, they're there because they want to have some type of a change occur. Right. And so it's identifying, okay, you want to lose 50 pounds? Cool. Why? Um, cause I, cause I, I want to get healthier. Okay, cool. Well, why, why do you want to get healthier? Right. I mean, you're not dead right now. You're healthier than someone else. Like what does that d- 50 pounds? Like what, what is that going to be? That's different for you. Oh, well, I just, I, um, I don't want to die or like my dad had a heart attack. And so, uh, I'm like, okay, well, we don't want to have a heart attack. That's cool. That gets right. us something. And so it's kind of just digging in deeper and deeper and deeper on that first appointment. And, and, and people are, are just amazing at, at, um, the cool thing I get to see every day is people being a little bit vulnerable and starting to open up a little bit. And a lot of times it's a process of discovery together. I'm right. Like, oh. Yeah. Cause I mean, most people have not gone to this level deep and why they, I mean, it's, why you go to the gym? Oh, New Year's resolutions decided to go to the gym last a little bit, but like you're, yeah. you're ingraining a belief in them where I'm sure your retention's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of these guys I've worked with for 10, 12, 14 years. I'm in the sports since gosh, Mikel was <laughs> I think 15 yeah. years old when I, when I first met her. And, but the, the whole idea here is let's identify what's most important to you. What are your values? Because if we know what your values are and your belief system is, that's what's forming your identity. And right now you just have, I mean, our identity is just a series of habits that, and and I'm sure you believe in that, that our habits are what form our identity. 
but so much of those habits have been established unconsciously. It's just stuff that we've done repetitively that in some way has been reinforced, and that's why we've repeated it. But when we go and go, my whole objective with clients is going, okay, unconsciously, we've gotten here. Let's hop in the driver's seat and consciously go, okay, here's what I'm going to consume because that's what I'm going to be made of. So let's identify the identity. What does that person look like? And so a lot of the high successful people, like clients that have worked with their own billion dollar companies or professional athletes is going, okay, you've excelled in this area of life. Right. And right now what we're just tr- looking to establish is some congruency to go, you've knocked out, hit it out of the park in the financial world and in your business or in your relationship. And right now here's your body and here's the rest of you. And so all we're looking to do here is to make it so that it all is congruent. And so now when you look at, okay, I'm going to make these changes in my life, this is changes to get to really who I really identify as in these other areas. Right. And then I'm not doing what I want to do just because of what I want to get, but rather I'm just bringing my body in alignment with how I run and operate the rest of my life. And right. so then we're doing things because of it's who we are. And that's when it doesn't require all this grit and motivation and push. It would feel wrong to not be doing what we're doing. Right. How hard has it been to, cause some people, you know, whether they're overweight or they've been a certain way for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how have you been able to overcome that identity crisis? Because I'm sure that they have like, Oh, I'm, you know, oh, I'm overweight. Oh, I'm ugly. Oh, I'm this. Oh, I'm that. Like, that's just who I am. And it's like, like, you know, what are some things that you have them do short of basically an interview where you, you can help them with their identity crisis? Cause you know, it happens with the opposite happens with bodybuilders going back to, you know, whether like in in their four, well, when they stop bodybuilding Mm -hmm. or, or really like anybody like athletes and, you know, different people, if they Mm -hmm. had, there's an identity crisis when it, when a, when a change happens or there's a shift in anything. Yeah. Well, it's, it's uh, a lot of it is in that first appointment, laying the groundwork of because um, right now they have an identity that they haven't consciously constructed. And a lot of people have this external locus of control that they believe that they are how they are because of their childhood or because of circumstance or because of social influence. And it's those are contributing factors. But to be able to divorce from that belief and go, OK, I'm good, I can develop this internal locus of control that. Everything in my life exists because I created it either by something that I did or by how I decided to respond to something. Right. And that's a concept that most people have just never even heard it expressed that way. They just assume that things are the way they are and they look around them. And a lot of times the people that they're running with or how their family is, they look similar, they act similar. And so they just assume that that's just how things come to be. But when you're able to just, give that little glimpse of light to someone and go, you know what? This isn't just how things are. This is, these are decisions that we've made and we can make different decisions to completely transform how we, how we construct ourselves. Right. And so as for the difficulty of it, really the first part is they just have no idea that that's even possible. And so what I do is during our sessions, a lot of it is catching how things are described and that, um, I always say, watch your language, because when we, it's hard for me to talk without my dry race bar. Right. I'm always like writing <laughs> and explaining on this, but that um, that our language is what determines the meaning that we give to things, and the meaning that we give to things is what determines our emotional response, and our emotional response determines what we're going to do or not do. Right. And so what we want to do is create these communication patterns within ourselves to where it isn't just unconscious uh, uh, reflex that you've got your central nervous system or your, your five senses that are all just relaying information to your brain. But that's just data. That's just information. It passes through the filter of your belief system. And then based on your bias, your childhood, your social influence, your brain doesn't want to put a lot of work to it. It goes, oh, okay, I heard that. I saw that. I felt that. That means this. And therefore, here's the emotional response. And then that drives my action. Right. And so if a person says, you know, I'm just... I'm just a big guy. Everybody in my family is overweight. Big bone. That, yeah, big <laughs> bone. That's just how I am. And it's just right. like, sure, there are genetic influence, influential factors, but you can alter your physiology. Anybody, I mean, a world-class athlete and someone who's morbidly obese, they have so much in common on a DNA level that we can go, okay, there are messages we can send to your body to make it do this, that, or the other. We just need to make sure that we're controlling what elements play into that. Right. And so... What, what I look to do is to help a person separate behaviors versus identity and go, 
okay, if someone says I am a stress eater, then it's like, okay, hang on. That's an identity statement. Right. And when we identify with the habit that is producing the uh, part of us that we don't like, there's a part of us that's attached to it. We don't want to diverge from that. They might say that they do, but when a person says, I'm a stress eater, I'm an emotional eater, I'm, I'm just a big guy, I'm always overweight, when they start making these changes, their brain is just keeping a little list of, hey, that's not what we do. That's not who we are. We don't, we don't portion control. We don't track our food. I'm not a right. calorie counter. And these are all identity statements that people don't realize that that's really the degree of intensity that they are. They are saying that is who they are. And as soon as they diverge and they crash, there's this moment of relief that they go, oh, I fell off and I always do this. And this is why I never make it all, all the way to my goal. And in that moment, sure, there's disappointment, but there honestly is an unconscious moment of relief that's just like, okay, back to the how I normally live. This is right. who I am. And so unless we've said, okay, I want to take on a new identity and my decisions and my communication to myself is what is creating this identity within myself, then again, we can't progress towards a target that we haven't clearly established as our vision for ourselves. Right. So they got to know what's my identity now, what's the one I'm choosing, and then what's that going to do for me? Once you're not this big guy, and once you're not a stress eater, okay, once you've identified when I'm stressed, I seek to use food to change my emotional state because there are certain foods that influence my neurotransmitter release to cause dopamine and serotonin to flood my brain and then I feel better. That's just a habit. Right. That's just physiology. There are other ways that we can elicit that type of neurotransmitter response that don't involve food. So let me coach you. Let me show you a couple things to keep in your back pocket so when that emotional trigger hits, that, that we're not telling ourselves, that means that I now must eat treats. That means that I now must eat this food. It goes, that means... I'm in a stressed emotional state. Let me catch myself because unconscious could just take the wheel here, but no, I'm oh, going to wow. go, we're going to go conscious on this and go, okay, all right. There are things I can do with my breathing, my posture, my facial expressions, how I communicate, whether or not I move, putting on a certain song when that moment hits, there are things that we can do with from nutritional supplementation, anxiolytics like ashwagandha that we can time at certain times of the day. If this is a cyclical pattern, there is so much strategy that can be put into it that we're using to go, oh, I don't just stress eat because that's who I am. I have a habit that has been habits form when they're reinforced. Right. And I didn't have anything else to turn to because I just didn't know there was other options. And right. so first of all, it's going, you don't do that because it's who you are. You do that. Anything that we do repeatedly is just because it was reinforced at some level. Well, now that we've got another option, let's do this enough times in a row that now the unconscious thing is, Oh, I'm stressed. That means I need to stand up, move, change my breathing, put on this certain song, you know, whatever it is that we've established as the new habit. And now the thought of treats is no longer there. Right. And so when people get enough of those in a row, then you just, there's this tipping point. It's so rewarding to see that in person where they're just like, I've got control over my life. Right. Like this, I can now change what my body does at my own will. And I'm doing it because I want to. Right. Not because I should. Like right. we talk about the, you can shit all over yourselves, but until it becomes a must, you will not take consistent action. And it won't be a must until there's enough purpose and meaning behind it. So that has to be clarified in the beginning so that you know the end from the beginning. Right. And go, this action gives me this thing. And that's why here's how it's going to meet my needs. And here's how I'll be able to contribute to someone else because of it. Dude, this is good, good stuff. Man. This is powerful. I mean, this is, this is so much deeper than just, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, like you're pretty much like a life coach. I mean, you can kind of say, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of parts <laughs> because, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, I'm not gonna name the gyms out there, but a lot of, you can call them like big box gyms. I don't know what you want to call Big yeah, commercialized gyms. <laughs> yeah. They really are just in it. Like they look at that as a total, just, I mean, it, it is income producing, you mm -hmm. know, department is personal training, but sure. you know, you're looking at those people and I'm not, you know, nothing I'm not here to judge, but you're like, you know, how short of, the 30 minute session at the gym, what else is going on? Because mm -hmm. yeah, you can give them a meal plan. You can give them this, you can give them that, but like you take it so much deeper and you change their, you change them pretty much as a core. You, like you talk about, you change their values. Mm -hmm. Now you're training their unconscious mind, which I've been studying a lot lately. Like this is funny. We're having this conversation because I'm actually going to a, a session in Scottsdale, hopefully soon. Um, you know, with a, with a company called upgrade. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but they, they're pr pr pretty wild. I've heard some insane stories about the unconscious mind, 
and taking control of that unconscious mind and, you know, ver unconscious versus conscious mind is incredible. I never, I could, you know, I, I've been aware of stuff like that, but I didn't know how much the unconscious mind dictates your life with Absolutely. habits because you unconsciously do things yeah. they, like just from like these guys are like, you know, shower differently. Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> like, I'm sure that you literally put the, it's like a routine and you wash your body the exact same. You wash your hair with, they, they were, they, you know, I heard the study one time now that I've been looking at it, I looked up some YouTube videos and they're like, there's studies where they, they took a hundred people and they just videoed them washing their hair, mm -hmm. you know, 10 times. And within 10 times they were within like a certain amount of like, like rubs, like <laughs> within every time, like that's, Absolutely. that's how creatures of habit we are. It's, mm -hmm. it's insane. And to be able to tap into that and change that for people is huge because I'm sure that you get a lot of people that are just like, I'm at my wits end. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Like I've never been able to lose weight. I have this or even yeah. issues like, Oh, I have a thyroid problem. I'm always going to be overweight. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, I'm going to just fix the thyroid problem. And then we can figure out your, your nutrition and your fitness. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. it's incredible. It's, it's, and, and for me, it's like when someone walks in and they're like, I've tried everything. Well, first of all, that tells you, we're going to adjust that too. <laughs> right. You haven't tried everything because something will work. Right. And if you've got a low thyroid, that doesn't mean you are incapable of losing fat. It means that there are different strategies we need to implement that still make that possible. But to me, it's like a person that's got low thyroid and high blood pressure. And a, there, there was a client that I had that, uh, this was like my first year of personal training and his list of, of, what would put him into a special population. So people that require some type of physician oversight. So he had gotten a DUI and, or, or was about to get a DUI. I got pulled over and he was drunk and in his drunken stupor of genius, he decides to run from the cops and he jumps the guardrail without realizing he's on a bridge and it's over land. <laughs> so oh, he wow. does a front foot lands on his feet. His knee socket goes up into his eye. And so by the time I met him, he had a artif artificial hips on both sides, an artificial knee, type two diabetes, psychosis, uh, and that he had self medicated for the pain from all of these issues with heroin for ten years and high blood pressure and wow everything under the sun. And so I'm brand new, like I'm Brad I'm Bushy Tail, just home off my mission actually, and I'm right. like, okay, well I don't that in that moment I don't know everything that needs to be done for that. But by the time I see him again, I'm going to be an expert on it. And like that excites me. Like anytime it's a new challenge or like a person that's never had success in, I'm like, okay, awesome. Bring it on. Let's do this. Right. And um, I think that's part of what makes a, a coach successful is we have to see how in our own psychology, how do we view problems? How do we right. respond to stresses? And, and what I look to seek to train in my coaches is that, this is an emotional game. Emotions what drive our decisions. And so first we have to learn to master our own. Once we can do that, then we have the capacity to help others to do so. Right. And so, um, anyway, I forget where yeah. I even where I was going with that. You're good. That's good stuff. One thing I want to ask you, which I know a lot of people run into this, uh, this issue is, you know, you, like you say what you say and like you believe what you believe and like you, you can do this with, with clients rinse and repeat. Right. Mm -hmm. How have you been able to duplicate yourself? I, I get this question all the time. Look, like, you know, I'm a, you know, I explain it at like superstar bases, bases or superstar based business versus a system based business and creating that really that, that system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how have you been able to do that? Because it, it's a pretty unique approach mm -hmm. and you're asking a lot of these coaches. Like I'm sure when people go, I'm going to be a personal trainer. They're not like, that I'm gonna I'm gonna know all about their life, their issues, their family issues, why they do things. All that. I mean, you're like I said earlier, like you're pretty much like a life coach mm -hmm. and nutrition coach. Yeah. That's a you. That's a very small population of, of people in finding people that care. How have you How have you been able to duplicate yourself and then find people that are receptive of that? So in terms of staff and like how to, how yeah. to instill that in someone. Yeah. Um, well, I'm extremely extremely picky on who I pick as trainers, and uh, that's kind of the first part is that when someone says I'm a certified trainer or like someone's in great shape, that honestly doesn't really mean anything to me. Right. Um, certifications are not hard to obtain. I do require that they have an accredited certification, but honestly you could knock that out in a week if you wanted to. I mean, I'm not going to say there's online courses, but there's online courses. <laughs> there's online courses. Can, yeah. yeah. Well, and it's like, 
you go to a, if it's a doctor, if it's a nurse, if it's a lawyer, there are standards that they have to pass. There is a test that they all have to pass. And so you assume at least a certain level of education and, and intelligence is going to be there when you meet with that person. Right. Personal training, there is just not that standard out there. And so um, having a certification, no one's ever asked me what certification I have in the entire time I've been a personal trainer. Really? No one's well, even I mean, asked if I, I mean, was. You wouldn't even know what that is. It's not really publicized. It's just yeah. I'm a personal, I'm a, I'm a certified personal trainer. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. What does that mean? Yeah. yeah. And it's not a protected title either. So someone could just call themselves that or, or and, uh, and, and they just need a certificate with their name off. Right. Name on it. They could print off in, in 30 minutes. So. Right. Um, that's not really my filter. Someone being in ridiculously good shape. That's my filter. I want to sit down across the, the desk with someone and I want to see it. I want to gauge h- how I would see this person in terms of their level of empathy. Cause that's, if you want to be able to influence someone, cause that's our job. I mean, that's a, in, so I was coach my trainers. Leadership is the skill of all skills. And right. that is just a skill of influence. And if a person can influence themselves and master themselves that way, they will have the capacity to be a good coach. If they can't, then they're going to be limited in that. Right. So part of it is seeing how a person operates their own machinery, their own emotions. And then the other part is, um, could I see this person sitting across the table from someone who's 400 pounds and has never stepped uh, into the gym in their life and see them be the thing that made them comfortable there. And so a lot of your typical bro, you know, personal trainers or right. or fitness gurus, they might look the part of a personal trainer, but that's usually one of my red flags. <laughs> right. And so anyway, to answer your question, how have I how do I duplicate myself? How do I instill that in a trainer? Most of my trainers were clients first. Really? And that were I'd coached them for a year or two years, however many years. That actually used to be a prerequisite to be a trainer for me is that you had to be a client for at least six months. Wow. Because I wanted them to see what the process looks like on the other side of the table and to really be bought into what it can do for a person and therefore go, okay, now I want to do that for someone else. And so um, I haven't, that's not a a requirement anymore. It's still something that I definitely like, but um, all of our trainers have to go through trainer training and that's one-on-one with me to show them the structure and strategy of the nutrition and exercise part. Again, the easy part. Right. It's also where I'm going to take them through. Here's what we do on the psychological side. Here are the type of questions that we ask and that that has to be part of the system that we do. And if that's not something that they feel comfortable with, that's like no harm. Uh, right. No harm, no foul. There's a, there's an EOS down the road or right. I mean, there's, there are other gyms down the road that you're going to be a good fit for. For sure. <laughs> for sure. No, that, that that's so important because finding the right people to be able to, to, to buy into the cause to align yourself with the mission mm-hmm. and to, to do right in people's life is, is pretty difficult. I mean, I mean, it, it's kind of funny because I mean, that's the whole preface of why I started this culture camp because you know, I, I want to be able to share that. Yeah. And it's been hard to find, you know, people that I thought were super successful or, or had it all put together and then you go meet with them and you're like, dude, I, I wouldn't <laughs> have you on my party. I don't even know what you would talk about. Cause you're a jerk. Like you don't care about anybody. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, in the position that you're in with, with nutrition and, and because that's so vulnerable, like pe- people's, you know, weight or looks, or, I mean, that, that's really so vulnerable to them. If they're like, Hey, like no one wants to tell anybody's weight. No one wants to take their shirt off. No one wants to, to, to measure themselves. No one wants to, to like any, I mean, it's, it's a very vulnerable position and to be able to, to have clients trust you with that and trust that you're going to help them. And then also like dive deep into their mental state of things is, is such a vulnerable position Mm -hmm. that you have to find the right, have the right people. And that's why those traits are so much more valuable to me is like, I can take a, if I can find a person that is able to be empathetic and that has good mastery of themselves, at least to a certain degree, that's the harder part to teach the nutrition and exercise part. Again, that's easy. Right. That's formulaic. There's there's an art to it, especially on the nutrition side, but it's not it is something that you could essentially teach anyone. Right. We gotta bring in the first the people first that their desire is to help and contribute to others. And then we go, okay, let me add in also this educational piece of how to be an effective trainer from a exercise and nutrition standpoint. But if we have that as the base first, that they have a true desire to help people, 
it's the difference. Like uh, a lot of times people will say like that I'll meet at the gym, their new members and they're like, Oh man, I wish I had your job. I wish I got paid to work out. And I'm like, well, no one's ever paid me to work out right. first of all, but that that's, that is not even the slightest bit of what I really right. You're do. like, bro, I work out for like an hour, hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, I watch a lot of people work out, <laughs> but like, well, and the truth of it is my job in particular, like I don't actually go out onto the floor with clients very, very little. I mean, there is some form instruction that I go through that's brief, right? but I'll do 70 appointments in a week and I might step out on the gym floor for an hour cumulative. All of it is just conversation and coaching and going through these psychological elements, nutritional analysis, doing their measurements, and that that's really what the value of our our service is. My other coaches, they do work out their clients, and so that's a part of what they do. But for mine, right. it's 100% just across the table and, and, and talking about it. And so That's huge. That's cool. Yeah, and so I think that's something that's kind of unique about it is that people think of me as a trainer. Oh, you must just watch people work out all day. And it's like, actually, I, I don't really do that at all. They're, what needs to happen is here. Right. Let's develop that part. Then I can show you the easy part. That's the workout and nutrition side. Yeah. Cause that's just, you know, basically a sheet, do this, do that this many times. And yeah, and it's like, mean, it, yeah, it's easy. I mean, yeah. Not easy, but like it's, and there's it's very value straightforward. There, and we do what's called tandem training too, where I'll do their, their mindset, nutrition, accountability check-ins every couple of weeks and then I will design their routine or I'll work together with one of my other trainers and they'll work them out on the floor just because I don't have the, the time in my schedule to be able to do that right so for whatever people want to do with that that's an option but it's the it's what goes on in the office that really is where the changes come from from my perspective right it's where the magic happens. Yeah. Where the magic <laughs> happens. yeah. Um, one thing I do want to ask too is uh, when you're when you're meeting with someone, coaching them, what is the, what do you, what is usually your like the most, like the biggest struggle people usually have? Or like, you know, I guess mm-hmm. short of their identity. Cause we talked about that a lot, but you mm-hmm. know, what, what are people running into that they have like this block? Like wh- what is that? Um, I think people struggle the most with, uh, I mean the, the nutrition, nutrition in general is a bit of a challenge because exercise is one decision a day. Really you show up, you work out, Right. Nutrition can be a hundred decisions a day um, based on the visual cues that you encounter or um, picking which foods to eat. Not everyone wants to eat the same thing every day. And so um, the, the thing that I really like for my clients to do is to do food tracking. And it's not the only way to make nutrition successful. But what we do is use it as a tool to influence behavior. And it's the thing that people I would say struggle the most with because of how they label it in their mind. I don't have time to track my food. I don't have time to, to pull out a food scale and weigh things. And, um, just give an example of the story of this. There was a client of mine that I'd met with for several years and she came in and, uh, it'd been two weeks. That's our normal check-in interval. She had done 12 cardio workouts and 11 weight training workouts in those two weeks. So six days a week, Two times a day. I mean, that wasn't even her assignment. She was just like going all in, 100% workouts. Right. And she had tracked her food. And what I always tell people is if Oprah called me up and she was like, okay, I'm giving you 60 seconds to share with the planet the one habit that will make more of a difference for fat loss than anything else people could do. So if I had to pick between a supplement or a workout regimen or a eating strategy like intermittent fasting or a workout I only get to pick one thing. What will make more of a difference for a person than anything they could possibly do? And the answer that to that question is really, really easy because it does influence a person's calorie balance more than everything else. And that is to track their food before they eat it. And so that was, that's the thing that I would say people struggle with the most only because it is, it is, a little bit of work through the day, right? But the ones that do and that it create it as a habit for themselves, a, their progress is a lot faster, but B technically their variety is open to anything because there are certain numerical goals that we're looking to get with calories and macros. There are certain um, micronutrient goals that we're looking to get by covering a certain variety of foods and adding in certain highly bioavailable supplements, right? But they could piece that together and include a cheeseburger or ice cream or a birthday party or a cruise because they have that information in front of them readily available. And so 
this uh, this uh, gal that had done the six days a week workouts for two weeks, she had also tracked her food 100%. And we pull it up, and I look at the calorie average, and it was 1,250 calories a day, which is a very, very low intake. Right. And so from a physiology standpoint, there's 3,500 calories in a pound of fat, and we go through a 14-day period. If she's eating 1,250 and having workouts six days a week, we should be able to have a significantly larger deficit than 3,500. She should have lost, you know, two, three, four pounds of fat. Right. So I check her measurements and her body fat is dead even with last time. Hmm. And so these are the moments where a client starts to panic and starts to go, oh, it's because of my age or I'm a woman or it's hormones or it's the aligning of the planets or whatever right. it is, anything that's outside of our control. And it's not to say that that's a, a bad thing that they're doing, but that's the fear element that settles in. And that's when they start to go, Oh, this is just where I am now. And as a way to comfort themselves, they go, okay, that's my identity. That's who I am. But that's our chance to catch that right there in that moment and go, okay, hang on. Now the, what's great about this. I always tell my clients, anytime there's a problem, anything in life, this isn't just fitness. First question to ask is what's great about this. Right. You know, put your, I like that. Yeah. Putting your, put your ascending reticular activation system into a, 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 a position of seeking out answers because again, driving your conscious mind and your brain will do whatever you tell it to do. So if you tell it to go look for problems or reasons why you can't lose weight, it's going to do that. If you go, okay, what's great about this It's going to find a reason for that. How can I make this happen? You know, it's going to go and seek out that answer. Right. And so, um, I was like, okay, so what's great about this is this is actually an easy equation that we can look at the information here and go, okay, something's not quite right because it would be a physiological impossibility for you to consume this few of calories and have this much expenditure and not have fat loss happen. Cause right. if you're in a calorie deficit, either your body taps into its energy reserves to make up the difference or you die. Right. <laughs> your heart has to keep beating. You have to keep pushing blood. Energy processes are happening. If you've only consumed X amount from food, well then your body keeps in reserve fat and has hormones that sends out to mobilize that fat to be used for energy. And so what's great about this is we, this, uh, this number is inaccurate. Okay. And we can have comfort knowing that that's really the case. Right. And, and she's like, well, no, I know I tracked everything and, and I eat the same thing every day anyway. So it's super easy. So it can't be that. And I was like, okay, well, let's just, let's just pretend for a moment. Okay. That we don't know all that. Right. And I want to go through some three basic concepts that are going to make, uh, that are what we do on day one for nutrition for how to make, how to ensure fat loss. So rule number one, we're going to do this for the next 14 days. It's not have to be a life sentence, but I'm just, just humor me. Okay. Right. <laughs> you know, let's go 14 days, follow our three basic rules. Number one, we're going to track everything before we eat it. You say, oh, I eat the same thing every day. It's not going to be any different. I'm like, oh, no, 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 we're just, we're just going to pretend. Okay. You've never eaten, but like, you've never done this before. Um, let's just, let's just see what it does. Okay. So everything you got to track it before you eat it. Number two, we got to measure it before we track it. So a lot of times people, we know what three ounces of chicken looks like or half a cup of rice looks like. And so we get into these routines where we start to just go away from measuring. Right. Which isn't a problem unless it's a problem. If that's working, cool beans, no problem. If it's not, let's go back to make sure that we know all the pieces of the data. So I want you to use a food scale. That's going to be more accurate than using measuring a cup or an eyeball. We're going to do this with precision for 14 days. Rule right. number three is that you're only going to eat what you can accurately measure. And so, and she's like, well, I go out to eat with my friends and sometimes I don't know what it is. And, 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 Again, there, there's a strategy for that, but for the next 14 days, let's only go to places where they display the nutrition information. I'm not saying it even needs to be squeaky clean food. We just need to know what the information is. So just go to places they show their calories. That way you can track it in and we can watch what your total is. Right. Okay. So 14 days goes by, she comes back in and, uh, her workout frequency was actually two less, one less weight, one less cardio. And her average calorie intake was 1,340 calories a day. So it was 90 more than what the previous two weeks had said. But what gets really interesting is when I measured her body fat. So uh, I go up on the board again. I always like to put this in front of people. And I go, okay, last time your fat loss was zero. This time your body fat decreased. And I'm not talking just weight. I'm talking we have measured the amount of pounds of fat on your person. And we are comparing that total to the previous pounds of fat on your person last time. And it is 3.0 pounds less. Wow. Now... 
from a calorie deficit standpoint, there's 3,500 calories in a pound of fat. So that's a 10,500 calorie deficit over 14 days. If you average that out, that's 750 calories per day. And so when we look at, okay, here was your workout last time, here was your intake, and it said 1250, you were at a calorie balance. Now, this is saying that at 90 calories higher, you're at a 750 calorie deficit. That means that your tracking was off by 840 calories on average per day for the 14 days heading into last appointment. And so... Wow, you put it like that, it's like, dang. So, again, what's great about this is that it's a physics equation. Once we know the data, then we can look at it together side by side and go, this isn't about you like falling apart or hiding things from me or that you're this uh, way overeating, but there are details that add up here through the week. And I, I said, let me ask you a question. How much extra time do you think you had to put into tracking by doing it beforehand versus when you did it after and to do the little measuring? And she's like, well like two minutes a meal, honestly. And I'm like, yeah, so it was this, right? Not too bad. And so six meals a day, two minutes a meal, that's 12 minutes. Okay, all right. So our average calorie balance was affected by 840 per day by doing it this way in 12 minutes. So basically per minute invested in pre-tracking, you burn 70 calories. That's kind of like, that's the calorie balance effect of that. Right. And I was like, if I had a gizmo that I just said, okay, every time you eat, All you got to do is squeeze this gizmo for two minutes, and by the end of the day, it's going to affect your calorie balance by 840 calories. Everyone would buy it. Oh, for sure. It'd be like this. uh, over. I'd be a billionaire overnight. Right. But the thing is, we do have the gizmo. It's just your your phone. Right. And people put this idea of calorie tracking and and, um, using a food logger. Again, it's the language that they use to describe it to themselves that gives it the meaning of something that is overwhelming and that takes a lot of time and that's frustrating. That determines their emotional response to it, and then that determines what they're going to do or not do. Right. So we go trace back in and go, okay, how are you communicating this to yourself? What language are you using when you say, track my food? Because in my brain, what I say, like... And again, this is looking at literally the verbiage that's being drawn up in our minds so we can say, okay, what meaning is this? Because that's determining whether this seems like something really hard or this seems like something really simple. Okay? Right. So in my mind, it is I wiggle my thumbs. Like That's what food tracking is. Okay? Right. It's this. Because if someone says, oh, I got to pull my phone out and I gotta, I'm distracted and kids are running, it's crazy and, and there's so many things to think about. Da, da, and it's just like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Can you wiggle your thumbs for two minutes? I mean, is that something you are physically capable of doing? Right. When we describe it that way, then it's like, oh, you know, I think I can handle that. For sure. Get through 14 days of that and see the impact it made on your progress. And it made more of a difference than anything that you could have possibly done. I, I'm not going to throw an 840 calorie workout on top of what you were already doing twice a day. Right. That's the impact that it had. For sure. And that was a way longer story than you were asking no, for. No, it, it, <laughs> it's it's so good. And there's so many values there, there's so many things you could value this in, in just everyday life, right? Like there's yeah. how many times can you, you know, stop and smell the roses and figure something out? Or if an issue comes out, like, I love the fact that you're like, okay, what's great about this? Yeah. It's like, cause no one looks at that. Well, and, and you know, and we run into issues every single day that you over your tension, your ten is to overreact and kind of the world's falling apart. One of my favorite quotes, and I bring this up in almost every single po- single appointment is that winners anticipate and losers react. So, when we, the more that we can anticipate and look forward, then the less we get caught in these moments when we're either under some type of stress or something's urgent, we can go, okay, hang on. I have a game plan for this and right. I know what to do in this moment. So, um, the point of that story, and I, I know I went, sorry, wait, no, probably too long on you're that, great. but is that it all traced back to that habit of pre-tracking, making such a massive difference, but the, you asked what people struggle the most with. And I would say it's that idea of tracking their food beforehand, not because it's physically difficult, not because it's time consuming, but because of the language that they use to describe it to themselves and that making it seem like a extremely difficult task. And so part of my, my mission, my goal and for our trainers is to help people change how they describe things to themselves for the types of habits that are going to be the major bang for your buck. Cause at some point like people will fight it and fight it and fight it and fight it. And then I'll do it for two weeks and then I'll be like, oh my gosh, 
This is easy. This is easy. Yeah. And it made more of a difference than anything I've done so far. So it's like right. we can crash and burn for three, four, five, six months and then do this, or we can start doing this right now. Right. And honestly, sometimes people need that three, four, five, and six months to appreciate what it can do. And so that's part of what I think is is being a good coach is to never give up on people, allow them to fail enough times that they get to that success moment. Right. So, Dude, I anyway. I love that. Like that there's so many nuggets to to use in in everyday life and in dealing with any situation and any type of uh you know mountain you have to climb or anything dude, dude well, that is that's awesome it's like it's a lot of times people will be like are you sick of saying this for the hundredth time to me and i'm like no i'm super excited about it because it means that we are now one step closer right and i always give the the comparison of like a the stone cutter that's just they they got these little rudimentary tools and they they up against this giant boulder and they're just hitting their little nails in and it's just whack, whack, whack. You watch it for 20 minutes on a YouTube video and it seems like it's doing absolutely nothing. And it's just like, why is he just doing that same thing over and over? But the stone cutter has got this clear vision in his mind. He knows exactly what's going to happen if he does this enough times. And so never in that series of hits, does he go, ah, maybe maybe it's just not going to work. Right. And, but then the boulder splits and we all see that we go, wait, did he hit that one different? Like what made that happen that time? And in my mind, if I have to tell someone about pre-tracking their food or doing a workout a certain way or changing how they communicate to themselves, I'll do it a thousand times, 10,000 times, however many times it takes, because I know that one time is, it just takes that one time that it happens. And sometimes all of those leading up to it had to happen first. And a lot of times it's watching the client fail and fail and fail and fail and fail and they will give up on themselves but I always tell my 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 clients I'm like they will never give up on you because a uh this is what I live for right but I am an extremely goal-oriented person I will always get my goal and once you've told me what your goal is that's also my goal and so we're not going to stop on this and so I will say this a thousand different ways and and as many times as I have to and, uh, but we're going to get this and that boulder is going to split and we're going to share that moment. And from then on, you will have that breakthrough. That is your new reference point that you can always look back on and be like, you know what? I thought it wasn't going to work. Was it going to work? And then it did. And we got to capture everything about that moment in that session. And now we get to use that in other areas of life that this now spills into. Right you now. And so, and that once we have enough experiences like that, it's just like, wow, this can really This can reach so much further beyond what just fitness is. This is application. This has application in a relationship or in a business or in whatever it is. Right. No, dude, dude, this is so, so powerful. And there's so many lessons that, that, uh, I'm going to go back and re-listen to this episode a a, a million times because there's so many things of of the situation, just the little fact of the situations and then also, you know, creating the habits that, you know, might seem dumb might seem oh i don't really need to do that or i can do that later mm-hmm. of how impactful that can be in just a short amount of 14 days or or daily yeah you know i, I think there's so many things that people do of like oh i'll do that later i'll do that later they don't end up doing it mm-hmm. and then it, it it backfires on them when they can just create those habits and do it now and you're talking like when i ask people like oh like you know listen to a podcast every day i read every day reflect every day oh i don't have time for that <laughs> But dude, I'm the busiest person I know. <laughs> I know. Like I'm all over the place, but I always try to find a time to be mindful, think, reflect, read, listen to podcasts. I mean, it's easy because I drive them all the time, but like little things like that add up. But you've described it to yourself that way as right. easy. And that's why it is. Right. It's the language that we use. That's like, oh, well, I, <laughs> I guess it, an example is when people go to the bathroom and it's just like, you go to the bathroom three times a day. I know you're on Instagram. Right. And it's like, why don't if you were to invest that time in some type of personal development, I know that sounds weird. Maybe that's wasn't what we should be recording, but <laughs> maybe the bathroom isn't the best example, but the car. Right. Or like when you exercise. It's like that's an hour of time that sometimes people just devote to Netflix. And it's like, what if you were able to multitask and if stress eating is something that you have seen as a major problem, well, cool. Let's go invest that time listening to something that's going to serve you after the workout. And, but the idea there, Jason, is just like you described, you're the busiest person that you know. I stay super busy and somehow we find a way for these little things to go in. And a lot of times people be like, well, I don't have time to track. I don't have time to exercise because I'm so busy. And it's like, no, because you're so busy, you need to get your body in its best shape so that you can better do everything that you want to do for sure. 
and and sh- just using that that because phrase it's i'm too stressed so i can't eat healthy well it's i'm so stressed so uh, because i am so stressed i need to eat healthy right that's how i'm going to make that better and so just language changes yeah dude i, I love that last thing i'm going to ask you i ask everybody is uh what does success mean to you success how do you define success <laughs> um I would define success as as the type of thing where when you have clarity in what your vision is for yourself and that means so many different things for different people and you've decided who it is that you want to become and you've set that target for yourself, not as just a, a certain amount of money or a certain amount of weight loss or, or whatever, but there are attributes about a person that you want to become and that you are, you are embodying them with the habits you have selected and decided on and have progressed far enough to where you are not just enough for yourself to get by, but that you now have created enough abundance to a degree to even just help one other person that that's when success starts. And so I love that as that grows and grows and grows to me, the most successful person is the person that's going to be able to contribute the most and and influence the most. And that the further that reach is to me, that's how I would see success as being defined. Dude, that's, that's epic. That's huge. I love that, man. Um, Cameron, where can people find you? You know, you got evolution gym in Layton, Utah. Are you on social media? Yep. So our, our, uh, for the gym, it's Evo fit dot UT. Um, and my social media is at trainer Cameron. Um, that's probably the best place to find and to, to contact us is to DMS, uh, either DM myself or, or our, uh, Instagram there. Cool. Well, Cameron, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been so, so much fun and, and deep, man. I, I, <laughs> I, I love getting deep and, and I learned a lot today. So I appreciate you. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you, Jason.